The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Genesis 3, verse 1. The Bible says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 1 Timothy 2, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Romans 7, verse 9. While he was alive when he wrote that verse, physically, he must have meant he was alive spiritually once before when he didn't understand right from wrong, good from evil. But once he did, now God could hold him accountable for that knowledge. The Bible says the woman took of the forbidden fruit, quote, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, Genesis 3, verse 6. We read, and the eyes of them both were opened to guilt and sin, and they knew that they were naked, Genesis 3, verse 7. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, my point isn't who sinned first, the man or the woman, today. My, my point is that Satan deceived them both into rebellion and disobedience against the Lord. So the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. If all have sinned, then all need to be forgiven. Every human effort of man to be religious or to please God ends in failure. It always does. The works of man are sometimes called the fig leaf religion. They're trying to cover up the fact that they're naked spiritually in the eyes of a holy God. And it didn't take Satan very long to start introducing other ideas to man to get him to believe in other possibilities that might get him back in fellowship with God until his entire world was corrupted. Paul writes, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, little g, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Satan is the God of this world. Paul warns about deceitful ministers, saying, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is also transformed into an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 14. Satan has worked tirelessly to offer other ways to God. They look bright, they look appealing, but are contrary to the perfection and the will and the words of God, and contrary to the purity of the Lord Jesus himself. The world is filled with religion. The world is filled with uh, distractions. The world is filled with uh, uh, deceptions. I want you to turn to our first text for today, and that's going to be Jeremiah chapter 7. I'll give you a few moments. Jeremiah chapter 7. Verses 17 and 18. Jeremiah 7, verses 17 and 18. God says to Jeremiah, Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Verse uh, 18. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings under other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Go forward to Jeremiah 44. Jeremiah 44. And notice verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, 
and all, <clears throat> excuse me, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people dwelt, who dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, verse 17, But we will certainly do whatsoever goeth forth out of our mouths, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our, prince, our kings, and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals, and were well and saw no evil. Things were good every time we went to Mass each morning. Things were good when we'd pray the rosary every day. The Apostle Paul describes some heathen by saying, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, whose mind, who mind earthly things. Philippians 3, verse 19. Now look at Jeremiah 44, verse 25. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. And then God adds, Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. This sounds harsh to say, but the Roman Catholic religion does not worship God. They don't worship God, the Lord God of the Holy Scriptures at all. The true focus of their attention is on a goddess, a female deity, a demon of the ancient world. They commonly call her Mary, the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Virgin, Holy Mother Mary, and so on. They identify her as the Virgin Mother of Christ. They praise her perpetual virginity as her chief virtue. The Rosary says, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Uh -huh. That means she has to have the almost unlimited ability to recall everyone's identity, their name, and their problems, and pray for each one. She's called Mother of Divine Grace, sometimes. Sometimes she's called Mother of Good Counsel. Sometimes the Mother of Our Creator. She's sometimes called the Mother of Christians and Mother Most Pure and a hundred other uh, appellations. In 1982, I was fortunate to work for Jack Chick, Chick Publications. They're only four miles from this church, four miles right to their door. They're still located there, still producing tracks, sending around the world. And that year, they were, or a couple of years, length of time, they were publishing a series of comic books uh, telling the story of Alberto Rivera, who was a former Jesuit, a Spanish Jesuit priest who had gotten saved and was now telling his stories and uh, uh, predictions that he saw coming through Catholicism into the world. And they were getting blasted all over the place. Modern day Christians didn't want to hear it. They couldn't accept the idea that Roman Catholicism might not be real Christianity at all. Walter Martin uh, and the Christian Research Institute were criticizing Chick publications. I think Walter Martin once said, uh, Jack Chick prints nothing, or publishes nothing but printed garbage. Um, and he wrote a very good book called The Kingdom of the Cults. I'm not going to take that away from him. If you want to learn details and the backstories of Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, other groups, Seventh-day Adventists, his book, The Kingdom of the Cults, is second to none. The one subject he would never 
talk about was the doctrines of Roman Catholicism. He would uh, dance around that and avoid that. Walter Martin was not a premillennialist either. He is an amillennialist. Well, that book was then taken over, at least Ravi Zacharias became the new publisher or the editor, general editor of that book. Ravi Zacharias couldn't criticize Catholic doctrine either. You can find him answering the question, are Roman Catholics real Christians on the internet? And he kind of pussyfooted around and didn't really give a solid answer even though he was very articulate and eloquent as a, as a defender of Jesus Christ and the idea of God and the need for God. I won't take that away from him. But in 1982, there was a Christian booksellers convention at the Anaheim Convention Center, and Chick Publications uh, paid to have a booth set up there and display the products that they printed, and Dr. Rivera was going to be there to speak to people who had questions about his story, that which was being published at that time. Walter Martin also, in his organization, had a booth, Tyndale Publishers and other companies like that. Everyone's displaying their wares. Well, while at the, at the convention that week or weekend, they arranged a very informal debate between Dr. Rivera and Dr. Martin in a, in a hotel room, across a hotel table. And I suppose it was Chick Publications who was there to record it. And um, I managed to burn a copy for myself. Of course, it was you know cassette tapes in those days. And I'm sure I still have it somewhere, but I'll never forget <clears throat> Walter Martin accusing Dr. Rivera of being wrong, saying that this was the mother of harlots, according to the book of Revelation. How can you say that? How can you single out one church? And on the tape of the recording, you can hear Dr. Rivera say, let me ask you, if you go through the world, consider every faith and religion, every other Protestant denomination, every other religion in the East, in Europe, can you name me one other religion that calls itself mother? There was dead silence. Walter Martin didn't have an answer for a few seconds. I don't think he was expecting something like that. I thought, that's profound. I got to remember that one. Sometimes she's called the Ark of the Covenant in by Catholic writers. Sometimes she's called the Comforter of the afflicted, the gate of heaven, the destroyer of heresies, our co-redeemer. She's called the mirror of justice and numerous other titles. Sometimes she's even called the Morning Star. Exactly as the modern Bible versions call Lucifer the Morning Star. Isaiah 14, verse 12. But her image has been carried around the world by faithful followers, devotees, who believe in her and her miraculous power under different names, different countries, different sets of circumstances. Uh, she was called Isis in Egypt, also Ishtar. She was called Astarte, uh, Ashtoreth, and the name Easter is uh, alliterated with the same consonants. So the name Easter is a, another veiled name for the uh, female uh, goddess. Or deity. She was Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. She was called Xing Mu by the Chinese 1500 years before Christ. She's currently known as Our Lady of Lavang by Catholic Vietnamese. 
and uh, some of the churches in this area with Vietnamese uh, congregations have statues made in Vietnam and shipped here and the virgin statue they have on display has almost an Asiatic look to the face. Which I guess isn't surprising. She's called Our Lady of Akita, a city in Japan currently. Our Lady of Fatima, Portugal. Our Lady of Lourdes in France. And of course, Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. The story of Guadalupe is interesting. Some of you have never heard that. In 1531, a peasant named Juan Diego claims a virgin goddess appeared to him and told him she wanted a new church built in her honor at a certain spot. He ran and told his priest or bishop, and the priest said he needed some sort of proof or evidence. So the woman appeared to him again and said, go to a certain place. This was winter time. It was the light dusting of snow on the ground. And you'll find a rose bush in full bloom. Pluck off the roses and that'll be all the evidence you need that a miracle has appeared to you. So he did and found the rose bush in bloom, just as the image had said to him, took off his poncho, his serape, uh, plucked off the roses, rolled them up in his garment, ran back to the priest, opened up the garment, the roses fell to the ground, and that image was on his garment. Nowadays, it's on a Mexican's van. Um, <laughs> but that image is kept in a as a museum piece in a cathedral in Mexico City to her honor, and in 500 years, that fabric has not deteriorated. Every year, Catholics will travel with a replica of that image. Um, I suppose it's been blessed by a bishop or a priest somewhere. But they will travel that, with that image from church to church for a couple of days, give the local people time to come and kneel in front of it and pray before it and seek some sort of blessing. And then they move it on to another church the following weekend. That's why I said the Roman Catholic religion does not worship the Lord God of the Holy Scriptures. Yesterday I spoke to a preacher friend, Mexican-American. His family have been here. He's a real good Bible-believing preacher. And I told him what I was going to cover today. And he said, when, when I was growing up Catholic, we worshiped Mary. I knew we worshiped Mary. We never talked about God. And only once in a while would you hear the name Jesus mentioned. So we talked for a little while. And, uh, but the Bible says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And that admonition is given at least nine times throughout the scriptures. You recall that the Lord doubled Pharaoh's dream, or he repeated Pharaoh's dream about the seven good years and bad years. And Joseph said the interpretation was that God is going to do it. That's why he confirmed it a second time. So you need two, or better yet, three testimonies from scripture on the same subject before you can say something begins to be a Bible doctrine that you can then teach. Jeremiah identified the woman by name, calling her the Queen of Heaven three times, which we read a few minutes ago, 600 BC. If you get on the 60 freeway and go west to Roland Heights, exit Fullerton Road, turn left, now you're going south on Fullerton Road, one mile, you come to Queen of Heaven Cemetery. She's still operating using the same name. Didn't have to change her name since Jeremiah's time. That's part of the Catholic uh, Archdiocese of Los Angeles. 
John writes in Revelation 18, verse 17, How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. You know, you and I uh, are told to fight against her and expose her corruption. The Apostle Paul says, Fight the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. But he reminds us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. You and I aren't interested in picking a fight. I'm not interested in making people mad at me because they disagree with me or I with them. What purpose would that serve? What would be the point? Now, there are a lot of believers, I'll admit, I, I confess on our part, on our behalf, there are a lot of preachers, street preachers, a lot of believers who have so much zeal, they don't have any good sense. And uh, they make more enemies than they uh, attract friends. Sometimes you have to disarm the other person by saying, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. But 11, 12 years ago, I and a friend from work, we were at a Catholic church. We we're getting ready to begin a funeral service. We were standing out front, <clears throat> and this child abuse scandal was erupting around the world. And he said, what do you think of all that, Mike? I said, well, and so I had to say, you know, I'm not a Catholic, so let me say that much. I'm just an outsider making an observation. Once I said that, then whatever I said afterwards, he was willing to accept because he knew I'm not claiming to be some sort of expert. Sometimes that's the easiest way to say what needs to be said, what the other person needs to hear, without them getting mad at you. I said, it just seems to me, for centuries now, Catholic priests have been forbidden to marry, forbidden to have families, that's not natural to the human instinct and, and human, uh, you know, physical drive. So that's not natural. And then <clears throat> perhaps they heard a lot of confessions over the years, and they hear people come in and are willing to tell them their dirty laundry and reveal what they've been up to, what they've done, and want some sort of forgiveness. Now the priest has all this knowledge about them, and he's sworn to secrecy. And the garments they wear are long flowing gowns. They're not masculine looking clothing at all. And uh, they're not allowed to marry, they're not allowed to have families, but they're called father. I said, that's a bad ingredient. I said, uh, and then they are assisted by children also in soft or flowing gowns most of the time, boys, but, and, and human temptation can become very uh, great and unpredictable. And then, on top of that, the, the deity they spend most of their attention on is a female, a goddess. And I said, I know this much about most men's instinct. They don't want to be... Uh, second fiddle to a woman, no matter how divine her image is supposed to be. I said, this was a, a bomb waiting to blow up. This was an explosion waiting to happen, and now it's all happening almost the same time, about 10, 12 years ago. There have been movies about it, documentaries about it. The Los Angeles uh, Archdiocese spent six, over 600 million dollars settling lawsuits by former victims over the last 30, 40 years. Paul asks the Galatians in one place, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4, 16. 
our weapons, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't go out trying to start a fight. We don't go out trying to make enemies with people. At least we shouldn't. The Lord Jesus was meek and mild and passive, and yet he was uh, uh, bold when he needed to speak up and say the truth. And you and I should seek to be like him. But the truth and the work of the Holy Spirit and uh, uh, history and any scripture the other person is willing to listen to, all of those things have to work together to stir in the heart of the person to bring some measure of conviction. Evidently, some people want to get mad no matter what you've said to them, no matter how nice and pleasant you've tried to be. Christ said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and persecute you, or pray for, you, pray for them, uh, which despise, despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew 5, verse 44, excuse me. Well, that matches the Apostle Paul's instruction to us. He wrote, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Romans, uh, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, verses 20 and 21. Your kindness in response to somebody else's bitterness and anger uh, may actually be, be to their benefit. It may end up stimulating a little bit of guilt and conscience on their part that they weren't expecting to feel or to have. Of course, again, it may not. But that's what we're told to do. So today I, I've called this sermon Peaceful Protesters. You've all heard that this past year. So-called peaceful protesters. Everything I cite or claim is well-sourced and, uh, to the best of my ability, well-researched. So no one can say we've misrepresented. Um, let me ask, who, is the most, who do you think was the most beloved pope of the 20th century, the last 100 years? John Paul II, right? He had a long pontificate, 25, 26 years, something like that. He traveled more than any other pope, visited more countries, was more visible in the media. And it didn't take them very long to rush him to sainthood just a few years after he passed. But in a book called The Private Prayers of Pope John Paul II, I have a couple of copies. Obviously, those prayers were made public. They're not private. And these weren't really prayers. These were mostly speeches he made in uh, various places around the world. Politicians, whether it's a pope or a president, have just about everything they do documented and recorded and photographed. And it was the same way with, uh, it's the same way with popes as it is with popular politicians. But John Paul II said this in a speech. Never tire of knowing the mother of God better and better. And above all, do not tire of imitating her in her completeness, or rather complete openness to the will of God. Occupy yourselves solely with pleasing her so that you will never make her sad. That was on April 25th, 1987. Later, in the same speech, he said this, The rosary is a confidential conversation with Mary, in which we speak to her freely and trustingly. We confide in her our troubles, reveal to her our hopes, open our hearts to her. We declare that we are at her disposal for whatever she, in the name of her son, 
may ask of us. Notice how they just barely slight throw in the reference to Jesus without even giving his name. Might be Horus. Might be Baal. Roman Catholics will insist we don't worship Mary. We, we simply honor her. We simply honor her. Open your Bibles to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5. John, chapter 5. John, chapter 5, and notice what the Lord Jesus himself says. Verse 23. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Christ used the word honor to mean more than simply respect their achievements. He meant to worship. On September 30th, 1981, John Paul II said this, this was the last month of September, or last, rather the last day of September, and he said this, Tomorrow is the start of the month of October, in particular, to a more committed and devout daily recitation of the Holy Rosary. For centuries, this prayer has held an honored place in the worship of the Blessed Virgin. On April 4th, 1980, he said, O most holy virgin, may you be the only and everlasting consolation of the church who you love and protect. Comfort your bishops and your priests. Comfort the Christian communities. Comfort all that are charged with civil and religious, social, and political authority. Comfort this people which love you and worship you. Comfort the many immigrant families. I wonder who that was intended to encourage. Comfort the young. O oh, mother and comfort, comfort us all. And on July 3rd, 1986, he prayed to Mary, saying, Hail Mary, the angels, with the angels we greet you. We greet you with Elizabeth. We greet you with the words of the gospel. We praise you, beloved daughter of the Father. We bless you, mother of the divine word. We worship you. House of the Holy Spirit. We call on you, Mother of the whole church. We contemplate you, the perfection, or rather the perfect image of the hopes of humanity. One thing he didn't say was, We honor you. Their devotion to the idea of a goddess is much deeper than simply honor or respect. It is worship. The most beloved Pope of the past century said uh, they do worship the Queen of Heaven. And if you ever have to talk to someone about this issue, say, the Pope has declared, the most famous pope of the last century, has declared that Catholics do worship Mary. And you should consider him to be a better authority than your friend Ernie, your Catholic friend Ernie at work, who says, no, we don't. Well, the pope says you do. So I'm going to take his word over yours. Beside the virgin goddess, their image of Mary, the, the Queen of Heaven, Roman Catholics also worship a multitude 
of saints. Saints. People whose status has been elevated by the Vatican and the popes to a level where now you can call upon them for miracles. They will respond and help you in your various occupations. Jeremiah calls them other gods that the Lord that, that they might provoke the Lord God to anger. In Hinduism, according to a 2012 article by the Huffington Post, they said Hindus worship 33 million gods. How they keep them all straight, who knows? And according to Encyclopedia Britannica, there are over 10,000 saints in the Catholic religion that have been declared and registered over the centuries. So many so that many, some of the names have been lost and forgotten. Um. They help and protect people in their various uh, uh, jobs, occupations. There are saints for builders, cab drivers. I suppose that includes Uber drivers now also. Saints for librarians, saints for storekeepers, saints for barren women to help conceive children. Saint Nicholas is the protective saint of beer drinkers. So some of you are gearing up for Christmas already. I'm just kidding. Man. It would seem as though the more time goes on, the older God gets, the weaker he gets, and he needs more help. So there's this ever-growing pantheon of Catholic saints who have been named and declared to protect people and help people in various jobs over the centuries. So there are patron saints to help with um, actors, lawyers, butchers, uh, bakers, singers, television. I don't know if that's watching or being involved in it. Patron saints to protect comedians, dentists, doctors, just about every occupation there is. And these are all according to uh, Encyclopedia of Catholic Saints. Now, according to that encyclopedia, uh, it's a 12-volume set. Someone stole the 12th volume, one for each month of the year. Someone stole the 12th volume, and the public library was willing to sell the other 11 for a couple of bucks, which I picked up, figuring I'll look through them, find something interesting. And I certainly did. You can come take a look at it afterwards. These are official, uh, official Catholic record. And each, each day of the year is also has profiles of several saints recognized on that particular day. St. Anthony of Padua, that's a town in Italy. His special day is June the 6th, or rather, uh, June 13th. That's the sixth month. So this is volume six of that set. And it says he was canonized in 1232. Quote, from the place of his tomb at Padua, the cult of St. Anthony has spread throughout the world. His power as a miracle worker has earned him unlimited popularity. And there is even a place in Provence, that's another city nearby, where his veneration is so great that the people have a prayer. O oh God, pray to St. Anthony for us. I'm going to show you right in the book if you want afterwards. The Roman Catholic Church can't resist relics either. A relic is something that was once 
once uh, touched or connected to one of their saints. Might be a small piece of clothing, tiny small piece of their bone, uh, piece of their, their uh, scalp, hair. Inside every Roman Catholic church at the altar where the priest does the changing of the wine and the wafer, they take a relic of some saint they've gotten and it's deposited in that altar, a small little hole where it's sealed in. And then they cover the altar with a, a cloth. But it's the presence of that relic that makes the altar holy and suitable now to do the changing of the wine and the wafer into the flesh and blood of Jesus. Before he was actually declared a pope, at least three churches in Italy kept small vials of Pope John Paul II's blood, hoping that once his um, sainthood was made official, then this blood would attract spiritual blessings to them and to their congregation. Now, I'm going to give you one more example before we bring this to a close. How many, if any of you, have ever heard of the Flying House of Loretto? You want to show me a hand? Nobody? Well, my wife has because she was raised a Catholic, but... The Flying House of Loretto. It's sort of a stone rock structure 30 feet long by about 13, 14 feet wide. It's very old looking, obviously. But the Catholic Church has spun the story that this was the actual house, one room house, where Joseph Mary uh, raised Jesus. They don't believe Christ had other brothers and sisters. That This one room was the house. And over the centuries, <coughs> God sent angels to pick up that house from Nazareth and fly it around, landing it at a couple of places, until about 700 years ago, it landed at this town called Loreto, Italy, near the coast. And it took about 100 years for the Catholic Church to build a giant cathedral up and over and around it. So you go into the cathedral, and then you can see the smaller building inside. Millions of people have been there, and it was authorized and approved by Pope Benedict XV in 1921. So it has been as officially accepted as anything could be, as official, that it really did happen, that the story is true, and people go there hoping to receive some special blessing, some special benefit for having gone there. Well, have you noticed, I haven't really raised my voice. I haven't tried to anger anybody. I haven't tried to make anybody mad at me. I haven't tried to get someone upset because I have a different viewpoint than they do. Some guys are real good at that. I watch some of these fellows on television who are very good at disarming the other person before they give their opinion. So the other person really has no reason to go irate and be upset with them. Sometimes you want to be able to do that, learn how to do that, speak boldly when you need to speak boldly, um, and not shy away when you need to speak up and let the other person know what's true and what's not true. But we're going to continue this uh, the next time I preach. And uh, there's a whole lot more to be learned. Uh, it's all based on well-researched material. Um, no matter how people try to hide it, no matter how they try to cover it up, wipe it off the internet, get rid of it. Fortunately, when you have old books, like I do, <laughs> you have it still printed uh, in its original form. 
and uh, you don't have to worry about someone just deleting it off their website.